Hey everyone, uh, thanks for coming. Really excited to be here. Um, yeah, so Spark is awesome, right? Everybody knows that you can use Spark for a whole uh, host of data science and engineering tasks across the stack, doing SQL queries, doing ML, uh, handling streaming workloads. Um, and just like Spark accelerated Hadoop, was built to accelerate Hadoop, we feel that there's a major role for GPU acceleration on top of Spark as well. And that's what I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about today. So MapD, uh, originally Massively Parallel Database, is a MPP database that leverages the parallelism of GPUs to get huge speed ups over CPU solutions. And we think that there's a very synergistic or complementary role it can play with uh, analytic systems like Apache Spark uh, and bringing kind of speed at scale for high value data sets, pulling uh, data out of Spark as a cache or you might think of it as a supercharger on top of Spark. And I know I only have 15 minutes here and I want to demo, so I'm gonna move pretty quick through the, through the slides. Um, great, so everybody knows data is growing, data growth is through the roof. Uh, we're looking at a, a roughly 40% year over year um, rate of data growth. Organizations are awash in data. CPU processing power is actually only increasing at 20% year over year. Um, and so this is actually top line numbers. Um, this is if you're using all of the AVX instructions from Intel and pulling basically every kind of performance trick in the book uh, to extract the maximum performance of CPUs. In reality, people are actually probably seeing less than this. Um, so you have this compute gap between the growth in data and the growth in CPU processing power. It's causing people to take all sorts of kind of awkward workarounds. People are downsampling heavily. Um, downsampling can be problematic in many cases, um, particularly uh, when you're concerned about outliers or long tail events. Uh, people are basically pre-aggregating data, um, and we all know the problems with that. And then people are scaling out to massive clusters, uh, which is fine, but big clusters cost um, a tremendous amount of money, require a lot of administrative resources, and certainly some problems just simply don't scale. So that's where GPUs come in. So GPUs uh, built on a fundamentally different architecture, originally uh, designed to power video games, have basically uh, seen a huge increase in performance year over year. Uh, so in fact, they're actually saying that um, if you actually look at um, NVIDIA's GPUs going from their Kepler to their Maxwell to their Pascal and now Volta generations, we've seen a roughly 50% year over year performance increase. And so not only is it keeping up with the growth in data, but it's actually beating it. And so if you actually look at a standard server, um, you get a whole lot more flops or computational bandwidth on a uh, GPU server than you do a CPU server uh, to the point where you can have almost 100 teraflops of single precision performance on a server. Uh, the memory bandwidth is the other half of the story, right? So a lot of analytics problems are fundamentally uh, memory bandwidth bound. Uh, GPUs, by leveraging the fastest memory technologies out there, such as high bandwidth memory, um, can see six uh, plus terab terabytes a second of memory bandwidth uh, on a single server. And so that allows you to scan data faster than ever before and give you real-time answers to your, to your questions. So that's where MathD comes in. So MathD was built from the ground up to leverage the parallelism of these GPUs to basically deliver orders of magnitude performance improvements um, and TCO benefits over CPU solutions. Uh, so MapD Core um, is the core, is aptly named because it's our core database product. It's at the core of our solution. It's an in-memory column store database leveraging these GPUs. And so something like Vertica or Teradata or SAP HANA or MemSQL, except it's using these GPUs to get huge speed ups. Um, and because one of the killer apps is so often slice and dice visual analytics, being able to take that speed and harness it, harness it to explore data at scale, we built MapD Immerse, which is a um, very easy to use web-based visual analytics engine that allows you to take not only the SQL speed of our backend, but also the ability of the GPUs on the backend to render data. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So um, obviously we're running on graphics cards. They were originally built to visualize data. Um, we can use them for that original purpose. And if you actually look at that map up there, that's actually rendering right on the, on the graphics card. So where does MathD sit in the overall ecosystem? Uh, so MathD can be your store of record. Sometimes it's used as that. It is a persistent store. Um, it does persist data on disk. Um, it's often used as kind of a cache or supercharger on another system. So imagine you have Hadoop, you have Spark. I'll get into the Spark in a little bit, in a minute. 
Um, another kind of database, MPP database, um, pulling data out of that. You can pull data in uh, with streaming data. You can pull streaming data in via Kafka. And then once it's in MACD, it's going to be hyper fast. Um, you can push it out to a third party viz tool like Tableau. Uh, you can use it for kind of real time programmatic queries, um, people looking for fraud, uh, people running batteries of queries to look for anomalies in their data. Or you can leverage MapD Immerse, which is the visual analytics tool, uh, which uh, basically works hand in glove with our backend. So just a little bit about MapD Core. So MapD Core, again, is the database engine. Uh, and I'm not sure who saw this, but we recently open sourced uh, MapD Core. So we open sourced it basically in its um, entirety. Um, it's gotten a lot of excitement, and so you can go on GitHub under an Apache license and find this today, uh, download the community edition, um, or uh, pull it on GitHub. So the first part of building a fast database, and I think a lot of people probably in the room are aware of this, is you have to basically take care where you actually put the data. So one of our first insights was, you know, if you're building a database on GPUs, you got to keep the hot data as close as you can to the actual computation. Uh, and that computation mostly occurring, is mostly occurring on the GPUs. So we're actually using the onboard VRAM um, of the GPUs, of multiple GPUs per server, and then on multiple servers, uh, basically as our L1 cache. So what we'll do is we'll take the hot data, the data that's frequently queried, and make sure that it is actually um, pushed into GPU RAM. And that GPU RAM can be relatively sizable today. So uh, we're talking uh, 24 to 32 gigabytes per GPU. Um, you can have uh, a standard server that you could get on Amazon today uh, with 8K80s, would have 192 gigabytes of video RAM. And we're compressing the data, we're a column store, we're only pushing the needed data into, into memory. Uh, so you can actually fit a lot of data. We have customers routinely running five, six, seven billion records even on a single server. Um, what doesn't fit in uh, GPU RAM, though, it's not game over. Uh, so we'll intelligently spill into CPU RAM, and then from there we'll spill into SSD, where we're persistently storing the data, and then from there we're you know may maybe pulling data out of a data lake, something like Apache Spark, um, what have you. And so the system does this all behind the scenes. There's no need for user involvement. Um, it just basically has multiple levels of buffer pool that it pulls the data through. Um, the other thing, and I'm cognizant of time here. Uh, we compile our queries on the fly. So traditional databases can be very inefficient. Um, they interpret their queries. We actually compile GPU code on the fly using something called LLVM. And the upshot is it makes MathD basically the fastest analytic database out there. Um, so we've had some independent benchmarks. Uh, this is Mark Litwinschik. Uh, he's benchmarked a whole host of systems. You'll see Spark on here. Um, somewhere middle of the list. Um, you'll see systems like Redshift. And on this 1 billion record, 1.2 billion record data set, we're running queries um, you know, as low as 20 milliseconds. Um, so getting a tremendous amount of throughput that you don't see in CPU systems. And just quickly, one of the things we're really excited about, and I think there could eventually be tie-ins to things like MLlib here, is um, at NVIDIA GTC, we just unveiled a partnership with uh, H2O and Continuum Analytics um, called the GPU Open Analytics Initiative, or GoAI. And our first project is the GPU Data Frame, or GDF. Basically a seamless way for us to interchange data between processes running on GPU, so that if you're doing kind of an end-to-end -end query to machine learning stack, you don't necessarily have to go back to the CPU um, and move data over the PCI bus. So we can just seamlessly hand data uh, using IPC functions uh, between processes. Um, happy to chat with you more about that. It's something we're really excited about, and there's been a tremendous excitement uh, among our customers and prospects about this. So just quickly, uh, MapD Immerse, uh, it's the visual analytics tool. I'd rather demo it than belabor it, but effectively it's a hybrid system where we use front-end render charts uh, when it makes sense. Uh, we use back-end render charts, run, actually running the SQL query on the GPU, uh, taking the result of that query, and without copying it, rendering it in situ. Uh, across multiple GPUs. I'll actually show you a demo where we're rendering across 32 GPUs over 11 and a half billion rows, um, sending back a compressed PNG to the browser. And so it allows us to render, oftentimes it's geospatial data, but it doesn't have to. You can see a scatter plot up there. Uh, there are other types of rendering that are not geospatial. Um, and so we can actually render granular data at scale interactively. Um, and we can composite it over base maps, so we can do hybrid rendering. 
And um, again, I'm, I'm nervous about time, so I'm just going to skip some of the details here. Uh, so talking about Spark, uh, one of the major use cases we see from our customers who are running big Spark clusters is even though Spark is relatively fast compared to Hadoop, you know, they had orders of magnitude improvement, performance improvement over Hadoop, once the data sets get big enough, it is difficult to do kind of real-time analytics in Spark. Um, and I know, um, I know the Spark maintainers are working on improving the performance, but they're still not going to be able to get the performance that you would get out of running on GPUs. And so we see kind of a modern analytic stack or pyramid where you know, your data lake is ultimately on Hadoop. Um, you're pulling more of the higher value data for in-memory processing into Spark, and then you can pull those uh, RDDs right into uh, MapD through JDBC, and that's your highest value data where you need sub-second response time over billions of rows. Um, so this is the, kind of the biggest data at the bottom of the stack, and it gets into progressively still big but smaller data, and as the value goes up, you can percolate it up the stack. And so it's, some, it's a use case we're really excited about. Uh, so quickly going to give you a demo. Um, let's see here. Let me actually do one demo, and then I'll show you the Spark connector. So let's see. As I mentioned here, um, this is the 11.5 billion record demo. This is running on four 4K80 nodes running on, actually it was running on Amazon, now it's running on our own servers. Um, and you can see here kind of the, uh, the power of the system. As I interactively zoom, um, I can zoom into um, the Louisiana area, everything cross filters. We're basically running all these queries in real time. Um, if I brush right here, I can actually see the, um, the oil spill uh, that occurred here in uh, late 2010. Um, and then I could drill down and say, I want to look at the anti-pollution boats. Um, I can get very granular. Um, similarly, so since we're based in San Francisco, I could actually I could go to San Francisco. And sitting here out of our office, we can actually see the boats mooring. And um, you can see where they uh, basically circle here in the high tide, particularly the tankers who will sit here and wait for the price of oil. Uh, to increase before they bring their oil into market. And <laughs> it's true, that's what they do. Um, so one of the things to actually to see what's going on here, so these are actually all SQL squ scan queries that are completing behind the scenes, 84 milliseconds, 38. Um, and so you can actually see that we're, we're not indexing anything. We're actually scanning all this data in real time. And we can do that because we have terabytes a second of memory bandwidth. Um, and we're pushing this data into the GPU. Um, so literally, this is where we're getting these order of magnitude performance improvements, and it gives you this unprecedented interactivity um, that you can't get on a CPU system. Um, just another example where you can actually look. Um, we can drill down into JFK. This is taxi data. Um, and actually, as I brush here on the timeline, I can actually see this area drop off. And that's um, actually when they knocked out the uh, Pan Am terminal. I could lasso this. We'll do a on-the-fly point and polygon query, um, and you can see that area drop off. So again, um, GPUs really powerful cr for crunching SQL at scale, uh, for doing some of this geoanalytics, um, as well as uh, doing the interactive visualization with the rendering pipeline. This is actually rendered uh, right, on the, uh, right on the GPU. Uh, so we're taking the SQL result and sending back, uh, rendering it on the GPU and sending a compressed PNG back. Uh, to the client. So just quickly, I wanted to actually show you uh, a connector to Spark. So this is just using the native JDBC functionality uh, that we have in both uh, Spark and MapD. Um, so for example, if I wanted to take some of that ship data set, this is actually a subset, um, and say the ship data set is even more massive, say it's hundreds of terabytes or something, and I wanted to bring a subset of it into MapD, I can just run a Spark SQL query. Um, say I want to filter where the vessel width is less than uh, 240. Um, I'll run this. We're going to be formalizing this into an actual uh, connector, um, which will be built natively into the system where you can pull data transparently out of Spark. Um, so there it's uh, basically receiving the data. And then, OK. Okay, so it's done, and 
I'm going to go in here, and then I can find the actual data set. So small subset, just for interactive purposes. I only pulled a million rows out, um, so we wouldn't, we'd be able to do this uh, during the talk. And now I can make a map. So I could say I want to do longitude, I want to do latitude. Um, it's all very easy to put together. And I guess we just had the zone zero. This is AIS data from the Coast Guard. Um, so you saw how easy that was. I actually pulled that data from Spark in real time into MathD, and now I can interactively visualize it. Um, great. Cool. So, yeah, open source. We're really excited about open sourcing. Uh, one of the reasons why we're so excited about open source is that we see that the whole analytics system on GPUs whether it's via Spark or whether it's some of the uh, deep learning frameworks like TensorFlow, Theano, Torch, all of these frameworks are open source. And we felt that to be a meaningful player in this ecosystem, where MapD could be used as the data processing engine beside, behind these frameworks, uh, we needed to actually um, open source the core of our product. Um, so we did that on uh, May 8th. Um, we've had kind of a tremendous uh, response from the community, people downloading it, using it, deploying it. Um, so I welcome everyone to, to go to our website and find it. You can either get the code on GitHub or, or download it on our website. So MapD was actually launched in 2013. We went into production at the beginning of uh, last year. We've got a great set of early customers um, deploying us across a variety of use cases uh, and verticals. Uh, so Verizon Wireless was one of our earliest and is now one of our biggest customers uh, using us to basically look at smartphone data, coming off their phones, assessing their network. Previously, they were using Oracle, and some of these queries would take hours over, you know, say, 10 billion records to see where calls are being dropped, where there are issues in their network. Uh, with MapD, they actually have sub-second response time, like you were seeing there. They, they love using Immerse to actually visualize the data. Uh, they do also use Tableau on top of us, and so they get real-time insight into their, um, into their network, and they can troubleshoot issues in real time. Uh, Huawei, um, analyzing wireless data coming off their network. EOG, big oil and gas company, doing visualization of kind of oil and uh, oil and gas data, or their oil well data, excuse me. So just quickly, uh, closing thoughts. Um, we feel that, you know, as exhibited in the beginning slides, uh, we're at an inflection point in compute. So CPU processing power is just not keeping up with the growth in data, and an alternative hardware paradigm is needed uh, to go forward, um, and we see GPUs as being that hardware paradigm. Uh, nothing else comes close in terms of the, the flops and memory bandwidth that you can pack in a, in a small footprint. And that small footprint allows you to scale up before you scale out. So as you see, MapD can go multi-node. We were running on a small four-node cluster uh, there. But you know, the first thing we can do is scale up and give tremendous power in a very, very small footprint. Um, and that also makes it a very, very suitable for a small, small footprint, high-performance cache on top of a larger data lake, data warehouse, or something like Spark, where you can seamlessly pull your high-value data in um, into MapD and interactively query it or interactively visualize it. Uh, we strongly, and finally, we strongly believe in integrated analytics. So um, uh, just like Spark, we feel that there's value in not just being a database, but actually doing more of the stack. So you can see on the, on the visual analytics side, um, by not only doing the querying, but also the rendering right on the GPU, uh, it gives us something more than the sum of its parts. All the data stays on the system, stays on the GPU. Um, similarly, having the hooks into ML, keeping the data on the GPU, using the GPU data frame, uh, gives, us a lot of, uh, gives us a lot of power in the sense that uh, we don't have to send uh, data back to the CPU. Um, you know, like siloed systems often have to do more work actually passing the data between processes uh, than they do actually computing on the data. So the GDF gives us a way to seamlessly interchange data between processes. Um, so yeah, we're excited about the path forward. We see there's a lot of synergies uh, with the uh, Spark ecosystem, and we look forward to building that with the community. Thank you. Any questions? All right, yes, for questions, please use the microphone. We only have, I mean, we're out of time, but Is we don't have Is your code written any, yeah. in C++ or Java? 
What's that? Is your product written in C++ or Java? Uh, the core of it is all C++. C++. Um, however, our parser, we use Apache Calcite for our parser, which is in Java. Um, and we use uh, JNI to, to actually handle that. So from Spark, you make a JNI call to your core? No, so that was straight through JDBC. You could see that. So we have a JDBC connector that plugs right into Spark and um, into um, Calcite. And then we were pulling that over, over JDBC from, from Spark. You also mentioned that right now when you were querying, there is no indexing. Does it support indexing or you don't need it so you don't have a support? We, um, yeah, so we don't support indexing. We don't have any near-term plans for that because our use cases are usually scan queries. Um, we will probably be adding primary key support for deduplication in the near future. Um, so there would be an index on that, on that primary key, but no. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, great demo, by the way. So my question on concurrency, when you have concurrent uh, users and, and specifically if like say optimizer pick a bad plan, how do we manage the scheduling for task on the, on the GPU? Yeah, so right now it's actually pretty coarse scheduling. Um, because the GPUs are so, so fast at actually crunching through these queries, you see a lot of these queries completing in 20, 30 milliseconds. Yeah, you know, we can actually, we basically give a query the, the whole GPU we can actually do concurrent inserts at the same time, so those aren't blocked. But the requeries basically run these scans, and so you can imagine if you're running uh, 20 milliseconds, you can get 50, yeah, 50 in a second. Say I forget the word close and end up being a cross product of huge two tables. Yeah. What happened in this case? Uh, so normally we would say that you should partition your your join tables just like any other system. I mean. I think if you actually look at CPU systems, analytic systems, they also don't do well on heavy concurrency situations, particularly when you have a query exhausting. Correct, but scheduling, scheduling uh, tasks through the CPU is, is relatively a simple problem. The operating system take a very good job on that. But for the case of the GPU, submitting the job so, to the yeah. GPU, there's no time slicing. That's the one So right now, no. So right now it is, is basically a query gets to run. There's no time slicing. One thing we are working at is we can execute on the CPU, uh, which is nice because we're actually compiling mm -hmm. our queries uh, for CPU or GPU. Um, we might have two tracks where you could actually let some of the slower queries run on CPU in the background while giving the, the kind of easier, faster, interactive queries full access to the GPUs. We may also do some slicing of the GPUs in the future. Um, however, it does an amazing job. We have, we have customers with you know, 50, 100 simultaneous users who can't even do one or two of these queries on, say, a Vertica cluster, all running concurrently uh, without major, major issue. You showed um, the integration between MapD and Spark. MapD on top accessing Spark through JDBC. Um, one can also imagine um, MapD being integrated in Spark, showing up in Spark SQL as data source using the data source API. Would there be value or use cases that you want to do a join over some data you have in MapD, but you have also that huge other data um, yeah. in Spark and you want to just join it, and would that be faster instead of having MapD on top and trying to do all through MapD? It's something we've definitely thought about. So um, I think we're just making our first forays into you know building. We have JDBC, we have ODBC. Um, you know, looking at the Spark Data Source API would certainly be interesting. I mean, a lot of the stuff we do is customer driven, right? So if somebody says, "Hey, this is a valid use case," you know, we definitely definitely will look at it. All right, well, let's thank Todd once again.